I'm Matt. I'm Brennan. And this is Bourbon at the Bench. Call it swedger, pivot, reamer, pliers, pliers, swedging, call it swedging, hinge tube, cutters, post fitting, pliers. Drink, 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 chug, chug, chug. <coughs> okay, let's talk about key fitting. Key fitting. <laughs> what is uh, it? <laughs> Why do we do it? Ah, so many questions. Should we do it? Is it even worth it? <laughs> Is there an easy way to define key fitting? How snugly the keys are attached to the instrument. We know yeah. that the keys are supposed to go up and down. When you press a button, when you press on a touch piece, the pad goes down or the whole arm moves and whatever. We know they're supposed to go up and down, but occasionally, they also, on, they're not supposed to, but they will go side to side. Right. Or they will. Like between each other. Or yeah, between, between each the other. Between posts and that sort of thing. Um, or, or, they'll, or they'll tilt as the key's coming down if there's, if there's room. So, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious why we, why it's important. Because if you want the pad to cover the tone hole perfectly, which is kind of our entire purpose on this earth, is to make pads cover tone holes perfectly. If you want that to happen, you can't have extraneous movement in other directions other than up and down. Right. Is that is that like a is that a simplified enough with before even talking about how we fix it or anything, but why why we do it and why it's important. Yeah, and like and also kind of what it is, right? Mm. So, eliminating that play in the key work, right? Mhm. Mm there's a saxophone with all the keys on it. So we're talking about they go up and down. Right. But do they also go, you can hear clicking in this one, side to side this way. Yeah. That is, that is the enemy. So, so we yeah. fix it because <laughs> it makes the pads cover more consistently. But also, there are plenty of other benefits. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like it makes the action feel smoother and also it keeps the horn quieter. Um, yeah, that's a big one. I, you know, if you have like gaps between your keys, you can put a bunch of oil and stuff in there and it'll be pretty quiet. But as the oil dries out, those gaps are still there and you've got metal on metal to clank around. Yeah, so like to the the um, comparison I always like to use is a car engine is sealed up with gaskets to keep all of the oil inside. And when the oil goes in, it's relatively clear, and when it comes out, it's black. The saxophone is not sealed up with gaskets. It's essentially an open air mechanism. So the oil is going to sneak out before you want it to, which will make the, the key work noisy. So one of the benefits of, of getting the keys nice and snug is it eliminates some of those spaces for the oil to come out. The action feels better, the pads cover better, and the key work stays quieter longer. Right. And again, a running theme with most of our episodes, I think... Uh, along all of those lines, especially the pad work, it's the the foundation of your instrument is more stable now because there's less play, you know, or no play. So things are going to hold up and last much longer than if you just let loose things move around as they want, right? So yeah, and it allow it allows us to get the instrument adjusted as perfectly as possible. Because we, we know that saxophones have a lot of um, compound mechanisms where you press one key and um, four, three or four or two different things are moving all together simultaneously. Like uh, an easy example is in the right hand where F, E, or D all moves F sharp above it. So if those keys are fit loosely, and they're moving in other ways besides up and down, it can make that adjustment between the primary and secondary key much 
harder to get perfect and you end up having to over adjust it and then everything starts to feel mushy and that's that's never what we're what we're going for and and yet again this is another thing that brand new horns all brands straight from the factory you will likely be able to find some of this extra play and there's there are spots on the horn where it's not as big of a deal as far Mm -hmm. as things lining up perfectly and then there are other parts on the horn where it's a huge crucial deal that that these things are fit snugly i mean when we do this kind of work no key left behind everything gets you know nice and tight let's get into how we do it i was thinking first before we actually Mm. talk about the process maybe just going over the different types of keys on the saxophone so and then we can talk about the way we fix each one type of key on the saxophone are what we would call a hinge tube key so this is the g sharp off of this alto and this bar right here is actually just a tube i don't know if you'll be able to see uh which a rod or rod screw goes through um and it goes through the entire tube <laughs> we're both demoing it um watch out Vanna white uh so so hinge tube keys have long rod screws that go through the entire tube um that's this is an independent one this key i'm holding but the main stacks on your saxophone are typically going to be all on one long rod so it's several keys that are held onto the instrument by one rod that go through all of them yeah Um, from from here to here the whole upper stack is one they're all on one rod so if you took that rod off all those keys would fall off the instrument those hinge tube keys are all over your instrument some vintage horns are all hinge tube keys the sort of other main type of key we have are what i just call like pivot keys so here's the g key off of this alto and this long rod is actually a solid piece of brass so it's not a tube and on either end is a small hole that a screw will go into to hold it onto the instrument and then it can you know pivot um and the screws are called pivot screws. Um, so again, this is a solid piece of brass versus a tube with a rod going through it. And we use different methods to fit those different types of keys. Here you go. So that's a pivot screw versus... Just the, the little you know, bullet shape goes right the into rod. the end of the key. Yeah. 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 So if you look at your horn, you can try to identify those different types of keys but yeah we use different techniques to fit those keys i think the more interesting one is fitting the hinge tube keys myself Mm -hmm. and also probably the more time consuming one so maybe we can talk about how we actually do this starting with the hinge tube keys yep s-w-e-d-g-e swedge is yeah. what we're doing to to make these hinge tubes fit better. Um, swedging, swaging, whatever you want to call it. Essentially what it is, is squeezing the brass tighter around the steel rod that's going through it while simultaneously stretching the brass longer. So that's a, that's a great thing because oftentimes when a key is fit loosely, there are two things happening. One is the the brass tube that the steel rod is going through is worn out so there's too much space for the whole rod to wiggle around and the the ends of the hinge tube get worn out and the key gets too short and then it can slide in between the posts so the process of swedging squeezes the brass tighter around the rod stretches it out makes it fit tightly between the posts and that's exactly what we're going after there are a a plethora (laughs) of ways yeah to do this yeah i think dare i say the most common way would be to use swedging pliers yeah um which are special pliers um that have at least one hole going through them 
that will clamp around your key and then you just apply a little some pressure and I like to like twist on it and that mm -hmm. you know like Brennan just said you're squishing down the brass and at the same time elongating the tubing um, yeah so here here's the here's the low D key from a from an alto saxophone and it's it is part of the this long lower stack hinge rod so if I needed to stretch this key out or squeeze it down tightly um, you grab those pliers with the rod inside yes and and give it a give it a squeeze yeah in in a few different orientations for sure yeah I find that to be the most useful way generally because with the pliers you can get into tighter spaces mm -hmm. um, but you also have a what a call it swedger the a key for example <laughs> has has all of this space in the middle where you can grab with pliers right and squeeze down and stretch it out but there's no room on the on the these ends. ends yeah um another option is a call it swedging tool which you can see there's a there's a hole there with three slots going around so when you you put the key again with the rod inside you put the key inside of there mm -hmm. crank it down and it the thing i like about this is that it really uniformly squeezes down on the on the tube from three sides mm -hmm. whereas the pliers only give you two sides um but like matt was saying this is great but it's worthless on the a key because yeah. you can't there's, there's not there's nothing to grab onto yeah. yeah having both is is really nice but you can't do everything with the collet swedger but you can do everything with the pliers right like on this key real quick as an example you can see hopefully there's this tiny space of tubing between this spring hook and this arm here uh you have to have something very uh narrow to get in that gap and I like to fit as much of the tube as I possibly can mm -hmm. so that it's, you know, nice and snug and and even evenly right. swedged. That's why I like the pliers, but I totally get them not being Yeah, I like there. I really like having I really like having both. Um, but it, you know, like everything, it's all circumstantial. It depends yeah. on it depends on the exact problem and where it's located and blah 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 blah. Yeah. So um, this is a good segue into, okay, Matt, well, what if the key fits really well between the posts, but it's loose on the, on the hinge rod? You squeeze it down to make it snug on the hinge rod, but it stretches it out, but you didn't want to stretch it out. It, it, was, it was already the correct length. Now what? Cut it down. If when you're fitting the keys, the key gets too long, which happens a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, you have to remove some material from the ends of the key. And similar to our tone hole video, we're talking about pretty small amounts here. So we have these specialized cutters that trim a really nice, even, smooth surface off the end of the tube. All you do, slide the end in and then spin it. And it, and it will remove, yeah, it will cut just a tiny bit of brass off the end. Yeah. So... Another reason it's nice to cut off that little bit of the end is because oftentimes the, the ends of the tubes are not actually squared up, right? So you might have like two keys that are rubbing like this and there's this weird gap on the bottom or something. Not only are we making them longer, but then we can square them up and, you know, everything's getting really nice and straightened and tidy um, and this is, is gonna... this is something that you can often see like on a really bad relacquer, like a, a yeah. when they were buffing to remove the old lacquer, or honestly even just the really inexpensive kind of instruments you can find on the internet. Ideally, the the head of the post and the end of the hinge tube are perfectly flush together, so that oil cannot get out, or so that grit and debris cannot get inside the mechanisms. That's pretty hard to achieve. It takes a whole lot of time. Um, but it certainly doesn't come like that from the factory. And 
relacquers and and stuff like that where the ends of the keys have been buffed around um, you're certainly going to have an issue there that's one method of key fitting uh specifically for hinge tube keys and that depending on the horn can take hours and hours and hours of work uh, especially if you're going through very meticulously to get it you know perfect yeah i mean um, I, I it can it can be so many hours depending on how bad the horn is and this is this yeah. again this is one of the reasons we talked about the coa in an earlier episode um one of the biggest reasons to keep up on changing the oil of your saxophone is so that the ends of the keys don't wear away and then you get all these problems because as soon as as soon as it gets dirty as soon as there's no oil in the key work um the brass starts rubbing against itself and material starts to get worn away that's what's turning the oil black in the first place it's little bits of debris that are mixing in with the oil keeping up with maintenance will prevent the extensive key fitting repairs and i mean it can get so bad that um a few times in my life i've had to replace hinge tubes entirely because it was so far gone you couldn't stretch it far enough or it was too thin from being stretched you i've had to remove entire hinge tubes make new ones out of out of brass and braze them back together and you want to avoid that kind of stuff so this is just a quick plug to keep up with your regular maintenance please yes yes Um, all right so that's that's hinge tubes that's hinge tubes let's talk about how we fit the pivot keys so those are again the solid rod keys are held on between two posts and then a screw in either end so completely different procedure I guess I will add that it is technically possible to stretch the brass of these solid keys. Um, I've never done it. You have to have a special jig, a special tool to do it. And in my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a little less common for people to fit solid hinge keys in that way by, by stretching the solid brass. To my knowledge, that's a that's a much less common strategy. Um, our strategy, the more common one, involves just the ends of the key and the posts related yeah. to it. What is one method that you use? Well, if things are not super messed up, I usually just try to move the posts. Oftentimes, we didn't really talk about this, but the first step is usually to align the posts on the horn first, all the posts sticking up and everything. So I like to align those first and make sure the rod goes through those smoothly by itself. And then I'll do the swedging process. But with pivot keys to basically take out the play that might be up and down like this, perhaps one way is just moving those posts. So you're eliminating some of the gap between the key and the posts. Yeah, and again, this is if moving these posts... So you have to imagine the, the post is, is stuck to the bottom of the horn. So if you want to move the post, you can only tip the whole thing. You can't really take the whole thing perpendicular to the body and slide it in one way or the other. Unless you're going to unsolder a post and move it. Right. Right. And that's not even an option if it's connected to a rib. So it's often really easy to just take a to take a soft mallet or or something and just tap the post on either end a tiny bit and move them together. One thing to consider is if doing so is going to create a really uneven surface, right. then we have to kind of go to plan B. I usually will check Yeah, definitely. the, the existing conditions of things on a newer horn. Uh, they're usually not, you know, perfectly snug, but usually I find there's already sort of a weird angle. So maybe yeah. it just needs to be corrected actually. And then it's fine. Yep. Um, well, and the way I see it too, is like any, any amount of, of bumping of the instrument can, can train. I mean, like even the slightest thing of like bumping the chair next to you, we're talking like not even putting a dent in the horn necessarily. I believe that it's certainly possible for any amount of, of energy like that. To, to push posts, even in the smallest bit, enough to make a key wiggle, or if it happens numerous times, whatever. All I'm saying is it's certainly possible for the posts to just kind of 
stretch outwards and create room for the key to move. Right. For any number of reasons that could happen. So we knock them back together and then the key fits snug again. I mean, that's what I was taught. That's like, that's kind of like, I don't want to say like the main way, but that's like a pretty common approach to fitting these keys. The other option is the end of this solid key is carved out to the exact shape of the screw that's going into it. Mm -hmm. And the other way you can look at it is if the key is moving side to side, all that means is that the screw isn't going all the way into that channel and keeping it snug. One thing you can do is make the screw go farther into the key. We're not even moving posts at this point. We're just talking about the screw. And if you can make the screw go further into the key, that will eliminate the play. Yeah. Um, and to do that, you have to remove, remember the picture of the, of the pivot screw? There's a, there's a head on it that stops it from moving when it reaches the brass inside the post head. So right. one thing we can do, this is, this is the, the head here, the larger part. So when that runs into the brass, that's how far the screw is going in and how far it's going into the key. So if we can make that screw go further into the key, we will also eliminate the problem. To do that, we need to remove some brass inside the post head. The post is the, mm -hmm. the little pawn shaped piece pieces all over the horn, the chest pawn shaped pieces. Um, if we remove some brass from inside the post, that will allow the screw to go further through the post and further into the key. To do that, we've got special, very similar to, to these cutting tools. Um, we've got these tools that fit, these cutters that fit directly inside the post and remove a nice small amount of material. So it kind of just looks like a screwdriver, but it's, it's a cutter on the end here. Yeah. That is where the screw was. Yeah, there's there's the large diameter section and there's the small diameter section. The large diameter section is the part we're talking about removing some material so that the screw can go further in. This is called a post counter bore. It counter it will counter sink the space further so the screw can go in further. One other thing <coughs> related to pivot screws is what if you tighten the pivot screw all the way and the key's too tight between yes. the posts? Which, Which can happen for any side, number of reasons. Side note, if you have certain Yamahas, they will do that, so don't don't mess with your pivot screws. Yeah, <laughs> like um like sixty twos the and, older ones, yeah. And student models, um, they're actually designed so that you put the screw in until the key stops moving and then you back it off just a little bit. It's a very time-saving strategy yeah. um, for manufacturing. It's not the best because then those screws can kind of wander around by themselves potentially. But the thing, the, the, the spot I noticed, or you noticed it more is like the Pro Yamaha Berry is a 62 and it can happen in those sure. as well. Um, sure. So, agree. On on like a lot of the modern pro stuff, you don't that's not a concern, but it does pop up occasionally. Right. So, if it's if it's a modern pro horn where that's not a feature, if you put the screw all the way into the post and it's too tight, your options again are to move the posts away from each other to create some more space or increase the space inside the key for the screw to go into. Kind of like the opposite of what we were just doing. So the screw is going this far and you need to make the key have a, a channel in it that is that same distance. So to do that, we have yet another special tool. You're never going to be able to see this. It looks like a screwdriver blade, but on the end of it is the exact shape of that, that bullet looking point of the pivot screw. Mm -hmm. And it's carved into a cutter um, so that you put it into the end of the key like the G key, for example, that we keep talking about, you insert it into the end, and when you spin it, it gently removes some brass so the screw can go further into the key. Yeah. Which is just another thing that pops up in key fitting. Right. 
Well, who cares if it's rods or pivot screws? What what is it? What's the difference? What does it matter? They hold the key work on. When you've got a a rod this long with 17 key hinge tubes attached to it, if that instrument gets bumped at all, whether the whole instrument bends a little bit or one post moves a little bit, that one issue along a chain of of events this long can right. stop everything from moving. Because when that when like if a post in the middle moves, the whole rod does this, and now none of the keys attached to that rod can move anymore. Right. So I mean, we're talking about the stupidest little accident <laughs> can make the whole horn stop. Like all the keys just stop moving. You know, I I had a horn in here last week where some of these some of these long keys on top, the solid pivot keys like G and E, high E, and the high F sharp key. They were bent like crazy, but everything still worked fine because yeah. the the keys were held on by the ends, by the pivot screws. So it was weird looking and, and there was like this wobbly effect when you'd press the key, but it wasn't frozen because right. the pivot screws can still do their job. They're still holding the key on. The key still moves. Um, it's just... it. Man, it saves you so much hassle for, for little stuff. Now, if you bend one of those keys enough, it, the, the, the pad is going to move with it. But, man, there, there's so many, like, vintage berries where, like, the upper stack or the lower stack, the hinge yeah. rod is literally this long. And one thing gets bent and the, all those keys stop moving. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's always really fun to get to a modern Selmer when it's nothing but pivot <laughs> screws. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Of course, there's more to it than that, but it's kind of nice. You have to do a lot less squeezing, which is nice on the hands. True. One other step and one other level of craftsmanship that we will do. I, I really like that. I really like that uh, explanation because it's often skipped over. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't think about it and unfortunately it's really important not unfortunately but i mean it, it's it's really important um and it can cause a lot of problems and i remember when i was first starting i was having like i'm like the keys are so tight how could there be this issue what is going on and that's when i learned about post fitting yeah matt take it away uh, <laughs> so um Similar to, I guess, the hinge tube keys, the rod is going to go through posts a lot of the time. The bottom stack of a horn is a good example because there's a lot of posts that this one rod is going to go through. Posts have a hole going through them, so this can go through. This rod can be wobbly going through those posts. So... Like I was saying, similar to the hinge tube, we want to eliminate that wobbling and we fit the posts, basically, or fit the posts to the rod. So it's a snap. Again, fit. there's there's the there's the like difficult, complicated version of this, and then there's the <laughs> the like newer, easier, faster way to do it. Similar to like hinge tubes if the hinge tube is too short you could technically solder something onto the end of it to make it longer um, that's what people used to do with posts if the post was too loose you would either try and insert some brass inside and solder it to make the yeah. hole smaller um, i've heard of people just just putting some solder inside the hole and then drilling it out to the exact right size um, but what we have now are post fitting pliers and very similar to swedging with hinge tubes where we were stretching and manipulating brass these post fitting pliers um there's a flat side and there's a ball side you line up the ball inside the hole of the post head and when you squeeze it it crushes down the hole a little bit it moves the brass inward effectively shrinking the diameter of the hole which makes the post fit more the rod fit more snugly through the post and yeah. you can do it uh, you can do it on both sides um, honestly I like to I usually like to overdo it a little bit 
and then if you force fit the rod through it like two or three times it ends up it, it ends up kind of working itself out and for the record for anyone watching who's looking at the instrument like oh my god my keys are wiggling around it is not the end of the world you can still play the saxophone you can probably play it like that for 10 more years it's yeah. just when you're trying to get to the next level of like build quality or or you want the keys to stay quiet longer you're tired of having to dump oil all over the instrument like the this is when it becomes important and just overall stability again i think it yeah it seems like a very small thing but it it really is a huge part of i mean the overhaul process really i think it can that's, take it can take so long it can, especially an older horn that's yeah been through the ringer or, you know, someone who plays like their instrument hours upon hours every day. It's it's just constantly wearing down. It's like you yeah. said earlier, it's like a car engine. You know, you've got these metal parts working against each other constantly. Yeah, so, so if you look down at your saxophone and you see black oil in between the key work, it's time to get it cleaned. If you see that and you're not in a position with schedule or budget to get the work done, do yourself a favor, get some Q-tips and just get the black oil off and then put a drop of, of clean oil on top of that spot. It's not it's not the like long-term correct perfect thing to do, but it's a really good thing to do in the meantime. Yeah. If you can if you can remove some of that black oil and put a drop of clean oil on it in its place that's not a bad idea it's really important to remove the black oil first because if you just put more oil on top of it it's going to suck all that dirt and stuff inside the key work and start wearing everything away worse yeah, what are you I'm drinking saying, i am drinking old forester uh old fine whiskey this is something that nathan nab recommended i don't know much about it but it's really good. I got my dad a bottle for Christmas, so I figured I'd get myself a bottle. Hold for sir. Hold on. Can I go look at something real quick? Yeah. I so this isn't usually my thing. My mom gave me this. She got it as a birthday present um, from a friend, and she didn't like it. And it's Old Forester, but it's pre-made mint julep. Oh, nice. Yeah, I, I tried some a week ago or two. Um, Is it good? And it, it's so sweet. I uh, think it would be really good in the middle of summer in a tall glass of crushed ice. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. a true, but it, it was, it's just, it's pretty sweet. This is the Elijah Craig small batch. <laughs> this looks like so much, but it's just because of the giant ice ball in there. <laughs> no, it's a lot. You're I'm having a half a cup of bourbon today. It's a Thursday, mm -hmm. you know. Thirsty Thursday. Seventeen eighty nine is probably the company company date. Um, best small batch bourbon, San Francisco World Spirits Competition. Twenty eighteen double gold. Year after year, Elijah Craig is consistently recognized as one of the best bourbons by whiskey connoisseurs and industry experts. Ninety three points, Ultimate Spirits Challenge. Cheers. Happy Thursday. Next time, we're talking about materials. Where they go, how we choose them, and how we adhere them. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe. What do you think about this here? Oh, God. Cool, huh? Oh, boy. <laughs> Don't put that in. Not allowed. I look crazy. You are.